Hello, everybody. This is Mr. Hinnon, and now we are going to take a look at the Institute of Chapter 2, Kinematics in One Dimension. We're going to finally actually bring up the idea of physics. We're going to get into kinematics and what exactly that entails. So that is our plan for today. Um, if we do that, then our next step is uh, what exactly is kinematics? Kinematics is dealing with describing motion. So it's our way of actually describing what is going on with the motion of an object. Later on, we're going to get into the concept of dynamics. This is where we try to figure out the effect, what it happens with forces. This is what causes motion. So kinematics is just describing it. And later on, we talk about what causes with dynamics. This whole group is what's known as mechanics. So if you hear a physicist talk about they are studying mechanics, it has nothing to do with working on cars. It's dealing with the idea of describing motion, why, how, that type of thing. So our first step is the word displacement. Now we've already talked about displacement a little bit, but displacement is truly defined as a change in position. So a change in position. So what exactly is a position? So a position is how far you are from a reference point. So position is, is a distance and a direction from a reference point. So when we talk about positions, we always need some reference point. So for example, this car starts out, um, they write it as X zero, I'm writing it as X I, so some initial position. So this is kind of the origin over here, and we're measuring the front of the car is right there. And then later, the car ends up at this final position, it's F over here, so now the front of the car is there. So when we measure the displacement, we're looking at the change in that position. So with that change in position, remember displacement is gonna have a direction component to it as well. So for example, if I started two meters away from the origin, so right here is supposed to be the origin, and I start two meters away, and then I move to seven meters away. So initially I'm two, and then I'm finished out with seven. We know the displacement should be seven minus two, or in other words, they displace themselves five meters. In this case, everything is to the right, whatever that stands for. So this would also be to the right or to the east or however we're describing it. So I've got kind of using those little vectors, nothing too fancy with our vectors when we're dealing with displacement here. The next one, if I started at seven meters, so this is my initial, and I finish at two meters, now notice what has happened to my red arrow is it switched places. So we actually would take two minus seven, or I'd have a negative five meters. Remember, this negative is not a big deal. When we're talking about vectors, it just represents a direction. So it could be negative five meters to the right, since everything was described to the right, or actually my displacement is five meters to the left. So remember, the negative is just the opposite of that direction than what we're dealing with. This one's a funny one because yes, positions can also be negative. If this is actually my origin here, and I say I start two meters to the left of my origin and I finish five meters to the right of my origin, then I actually went from here all the way to here. And so again, to actually do this, I would take my final minus my initial, this would be kind of funny, but I moved seven meters to the right. That would be my displacement. So that's just more of, I put all that in there just so you could remember what it actually stands for. We're not going to use all of those little pieces probably nearly as much, but just realize that displacement does take into account direction, whereas distance does not. So the difference is distance is a scalar, no direction, displacement and position are vectors. Next up is speed and velocity. So our average speed is actually defined as distance divided by time. So it's distance traveled divided by the time it takes. 
Our unit is going to be the meter per second. So you're going to see a lot of M over S. And this is going to be kind of our first equation. You're going to see me commonly write this equation with S to represent speed, D to represent distance, and T to represent time. You may have learned this as a DIRT equation where you had rate equal distance over time, or in other words, distance was rate multiplied by time. I've never really liked DIRT because rates are too generic. Um, I really want speed. And so you'll hear me probably more often refer to the dust equation. So distance is equal to speed multiplied by time. Now I'm going to do one extra thing. I'm going to put a little line over my speed here. And this is just a way of representing the average for it. So it's not an instantaneous, it's not how fast you're going at that moment in time, but over a period of time, how far you are going and how fast. So let's try a simple little example here. Let's say that you travel for one and a half hours and your average speed is 2.2 meters per second. Um, I wanna know how far does this jogger actually travel? So at this point, if you want to try this out, you would pause the video and just kind of give it a try. Otherwise, you can just kind of watch along with me. So my equation is going to look like this. Average speed equals distance divided by time. Rearrange that. My distance should be my average speed multiplied by time. That's my dust equation. Um, my average speed is given right here. So this is the S and this is my time. But there's a mistake that I'm going to run into. If I leave this in hours and I leave this in meters per second, I am not going to get a distance in a correct unit. So one of the key things that I am going to be a big proponent of is whenever you are trying to do any of this work, make sure you are always putting into what I call the basic metric units. I like meters. I like seconds. So I would leave my speed as 2.22 meters per second. I like that. But my time over here, what I'm going to do for that is I want to change it into seconds. So this one and a half hours, this is why we are learning all this converting. I would want to multiply by 3,600 because that's how many seconds there are in one hour and that will change it over for me. So if I use my handy dandy calculator here, times 1.5, I get that there are 5,400 seconds. So that's what I'm going to actually put in here when solving this. So just kind of keep that in mind. So my distance, when I multiply these two together is, my calculator gives me 11988, so 11,988. The seconds will cancel out. I'm being left with meters, and that's one way to write it. We know that we've been playing around with significant figures. Since this only has two significant figures and this has three significant figures, I would round it to the least number. So I would round it to two. That means this one would stay. The second one, I would look at the number after it. So this would be... 12,000 meters is the best way, or I could write that at an extra zero, 12,000 meters is how far they've gone. I could change that to 12 kilometers or um, 1.2 times 10 to the fourth meters, however I wanted to kind of write it. So that's just practice with the speed equation. You have probably had the speed equation multiple times, not a big deal. Velocity is actually defined as displacement divided by time. So this makes it a little bit different. So average velocity, I'm going to use a V to represent this one, is a displacement, so delta X over delta T. So you're like, okay, how is that different from my speed equation? You know, I had average speed was distance over time, except for the letters, it seems like it's the same kind of general concept. And it sort of is, except here's the main difference. Velocity is a vector. It has a direction to it because displacement is a vector. So the fact that velocity and displace, or you're dealing with displacement, your velocity becomes a vector. You don't just say that you traveled at 2.22 meters per second that would be your speed. The minute you say 
that you went 2.22 meters per second north or northeast or things like that, that's now getting into the concept of vectors and a velocity. So this is our main difference here. This one's kind of a neat example. Um, they want us to actually find average velocities for this run, but the idea is back in 1997, and as far as I know, this has not been broken. Um, Andy Green broke the world land speed record in a rocket car, basically, and he traveled an average of 341.1 meters per second. And the way they do it is they run, they make two runs on the course, one in each direction. So in this particular case, he went in the positive direction, uh, whatever that is, maybe to the right, or probably more like east or north or south or west. And then he ran, then he had to basically switch his car around and go in the opposite direction. And one of the questions I always think is kind of neat, why would you need to do that? Why does he need to run it twice to actually show this? And why would you go in opposite directions? And the statement is already given up here, which we're trying to nullify wind speeds. Because if I was trying to break this land speed record, I would just make sure the wind is to my back to kind of help me. So you were trying to nullify that. So the wind doesn't actually help you. So if I'm trying to find these average velocities, I have this, I can write the arrow and the little line on top. I'm gonna to kind of get rid of that eventually. For right now, I'll just leave it. So I'm looking for a change in position over my change in time. Now, eventually you're gonna see these deltas probably disappear as well, because a lot of times you're just given the, the change in position right away. So like in the first run, it's a positive 1,609 meters, which is one mile. So they didn't tell us like, here's our start and here's our finish and the initial and final positions. A lot of times we just have the displacement directly. Same thing with time. Most often our time starts at zero and then we just need to use the final time here. So you'll see me kind of drop off that delta eventually. So my time for the first case is 4.74 seconds. So I just have to divide these out. So 1609 divided by 4.74, and I get 339.45. Positive number meters per second. And if I was being actually correct, I should actually get rid of this last five because we only get to keep four sig figs. And then this should have, should have been rounded up to a five here. Well, that's not actually the number we have for the average for everything, but then you can do the same thing with the second one. Notice he went slightly faster, so the wind probably was blowing in this particular direction to kind of help him out. Um, this is actually gonna be a negative velocity. That's one of the things that's gonna be weird is velocities can actually be negative because they have a direction to it. So we divide those out and we get that. And use my hand in a calculator real quick. 4.695. And I get 403, actually, negative 342.7 meters per second. So when I'm looking at this, when they average this to get this 341, they actually average the speeds, and speed is often thought of as just the velocity without your direction. So when you take away that direction, you, you get closer to your speed. It doesn't always work that way, but it often does. For example, your average velocity might end up actually being zero if you came back and finished at the same spot because your displacement could be zero if you finish at the same spot you started. So displacement is kind of funny because it takes into account every single piece. This is the reason why average is not always the, the best, but actually instantaneous is gonna be very important for us. 
Because if I was trying to find my instantaneous velocity, what I do, and this is where my, my calculus people are gonna understand this, my non-calculus don't understand, that I take the limit as I shrink this delta T down. So as I make it smaller and smaller and smaller, you can look at a very short little displacement over a very short period of time. And this gets you closer to what we refer to as the instantaneous velocity. So the reason why Isaac Newton actually developed differential calculus in order to better understand the concept of velocity and then later the concept of acceleration. Because if you want to talk about an instantaneous velocity or an instantaneous acceleration, we need to take the limit. I'm not going to worry about that. We'll just take short periods of time. We'll talk about instantaneous velocities, but we won't go into how we calculate it. I just thought I would kind of bring that up. Next up and last but not least for this little section on kinematics. So we've got displacement, we've got distance, we've got velocity, we've got speed, and finally we've got acceleration. So acceleration is when we have a change in velocity with time. Now I'm never really happy with the way they kind of describe this little statement where they say it's combined with the time during which the change occurs. It's not really what they mean by that. Here's truly their definition. So my average acceleration, we use A for acceleration here. Remember the arrow just indicates it's a vector and then the line at the top indicates we're dealing with average, is a change in velocity over my change in time. So it's actually the ratio of my change in velocity over my change in time. This is the way we're gonna write and define average acceleration. So let's try an example. Let's say my airplane here was initially not moving. So this V0 is zero or this VI is zero. And eventually it gets up to a final velocity of 260 kilometers per hour. It started at time zero, and then this final time is 29 seconds. And I wanna know the average acceleration of the plane. So the average acceleration of the plane would be my change in velocity over my change in time. So notice these are actually instantaneous velocities. They're how fast they're going at different moments in time. So that's going to be important. So I'm going to take my 260 kilometers per hour and subtract my zero meters per second and divide by my change in time, which is 29 seconds minus zero seconds. Now, a couple of little things. One, some people notice that, hey, you've got meters per second here and you've got kilometers per hour there. Can I do that? Um, remember, zero means it could be zero meters per second, zero kilometers per hour. It would work either way. So we're not worried about that. Um, the part that I think is kind of weird is even though this is metric, this is not actually my basic metric unit. So I'm going to show you two different ways of actually solving this problem. I could leave it like this. And these zeros really are not going to be important. And I just divide 260 divided by 29. And I get 8.965. Since I only get to keep two significant figures, this comes out to be approximately 9.0. And then it's got a funny unit. Nothing cancels over here. So this is kilometers per hour per second. Now that sounds kind of funny to actually write it like that. So this is the acceleration of this airplane. What it means is every second, this airplane is going nine kilometers per hour faster. So after one second, it's going nine kilometers per hour. After two seconds, it's going 18 kilometers per hour. After three seconds, it would be going 27 kilometers per hour. So we could actually judge that. So that's what acceleration means. It change in velocity over that time. However, a better way to actually write this would be to change this into meters per second. So I would love to take this 260 kilometers per hour and change it into meters per second. Now my suggestion for doing this, we're gonna do this a lot throughout the year, is I would keep kilometers per hour as one unit and meters per second as one unit 
and there are exactly 3.6 kilometers per hour in one meter per second. So if you divide by 3.6, you will change this into meters per second. So this would be 72.2 repeating meters per second. This is how I would solve this acceleration problem then. I would take my 72.2 meters per second and divide it by my 29 seconds. And now I get 2.5 for my answer. Now this is a funny unit. If you look at this, some people glance at this and they go meters per second over seconds. So they say, oh, the seconds will cancel and I'll just get meters. But that doesn't make any sense. Why would it be meters? It should not just be meters because that would just be a distance or a displacement. Instead, what you find is the seconds are both in the denominator, so you can't actually divide them. So this is going to be meters per second per second. You can leave it like that. Or a more common way we'll write this is meters over seconds squared. In other words, both of them are in the bottom. So again, what this means is that every second it's going to be going 2.5 meters per second faster. So after one second, it'd be going 2.5, then it'd be going five meters per second, then it'd be going 7.5 and so forth. So you can do acceleration that way as well. Either one will work. Last but not least, this is gonna be a strange one. Acceleration for us could be an increase in velocity or a decrease in velocity. You don't have to, it just says a change in velocity. So if this drag racer is driving around along at 28 meters per second at nine seconds, and then later it's at the 12 second mark, it's now going 13 meters per second. I said, what's the acceleration of the drag racer? I don't want you to say there is no acceleration because it's not speeding up. Acceleration does not have to be speeding up. Acceleration can be speeding up or it can be slowing down. And since velocity is a vector, there's a third way to accelerate. You can actually change your direction. We're going to see this in chapter five, so we're not going to tackle this now. But there's actually speeding up is acceleration, slowing down is acceleration, and changing direction is acceleration. So all of those. So on this one, if I was trying to find the acceleration, the average acceleration, I would take their final velocity which is 13 meters per second, minus their initial velocity, which was the 28 meters per second, over, and then the time period. So the 28 happened at the nine second mark, and the 13 happened at the 12. So I would take the final time minus the initial time. Now, most people would just glance at that and realize that's three seconds and not worry about it, but I thought I would just put it in there. So 13 minus 28 gives us a negative 15. And then if I divide that by 12 minus nine, which is three, I get the acceleration of this to be negative five meters per second per second, or negative five meters per second squared. The negative means that the acceleration is in the opposite direction that the thing is going. So don't just attribute negative to mean slowing down. It means that it's in the opposite direction. So this drag racer, if you notice the pictures, is moving to the right. The acceleration on this drag racer is in this direction. So it's a negative five meters per second squared. That's what that means, that the acceleration is in the opposite direction. So you could have a positive acceleration but be slowing down. If this object was moving with a negative velocity and you had a positive acceleration, that would mean slowing down. So the negative just indicates that it's the opposite, the direction it's going. Last but not least with our equations, oh, then we got this negative five meters per second squared. 
is I, I mean, this is too cumbersome to have to write the, the lines, the arrows on them. So you're going to see me kind of drop that. So you'll see me often just write V equal XF minus XI over this. And I actually will probably get more into the habit of just writing V equaling X over T. So I don't even like those deltas. I kind of get tired of them, where X represents my displacement. I know technically X is the position, but I just kind of always assume that the initials can kind of be dropped and then I can just not worry about the finals. With acceleration, I can't do this though, because my velocities will change. So my acceleration will still be a final velocity minus an initial velocity. And then I always like to get rid of the delta T. So I just write it over T like this. Um, or you'll see it as acceleration is a change in velocity over time. So these are the beginnings of our equations. We have our velocity and acceleration equation. Don't forget we also have our speed equation, distance divided by time. And like I said, technically this is an average speed. We'll go with this. So this is the beginning of kinematics. These are the five terms that we have. We have distance, displacement, which are scalar and vector. We have speed and velocity, which are scalar and vector. And then we have acceleration, which is a vector. There is no real scalar version of acceleration. It's just acceleration without that direction. So this has been an addition of the kinematics at the Institute.